Uh, it, it caused a lot of problems in the band. We, we recorded the basic tracks and did some vocals and um, some instrument overdubs and whatnot. And then we went on tour in the UK and Europe. And while we were gone, Terry went in and did his, uh, he kind of went over the top with his production uh, with choral singers and horns and uh, we came back and listened to it and went, holy mackerel, what have you done to this? This is not us. No, we didn't, we didn't want to have it be like that. That wasn't what we had in mind at all, but they'd already done it and they had the money invested in it and so um, it got released. And as in uh, rebellion over that, we went back to UK and recorded Farther Along in two weeks, very underproduced. The pendulum swang completely to the other side. In the winter of 1971, the Birds released what would be their final album, Farther Along. Further Along was almost conceived as the Birds' the revenge upon Terry Melcher. They set out to almost do a carbon copy of Bird Maniacs and denude it of all the orchestration and all the effects that Terry Melcher had put on and to say to him, Terry, this is how you make a record. Um, unfortunately, it was, it was a, a record made um, out of emotion rather than perhaps logic. They went over to England and tried to cut it in, in, in the space of a week or whatever. Um, a real minimalist attempt. It was a bit like a, it was a, bit like a bird maniacs unplugged of the time, if, if you could see it as such a thing. And they were going to, they were going to really show him. Unfortunately, its weakness was the same as Bird Maniacs, only this time you didn't have Melcher covered it all up with fancy effects. Um, its weakness was that the, the songs were not strong enough. We definitely wanted to distance ourselves from the overproduced um, Bird Maniacs. And uh, we went into the studio and we just let it roll there. And it, I think that Farther Along suffered from the fact that it was underproduced and done rapidly. There's some good things on it, but I, I think we suffered for lack of some, we needed more material, some more tunes. And uh, we, we pretty much produced ourselves, which it, it's okay, but we, we could have used some direction, I think. The strange thing about it was there was, there was Clarence bought So Fine, McGuinn did Tiffany Queen, which he wrote, of course, but that was a Chuck Berry style song, straight out of the, the school of Johnny B. Good. And you had the kind of strange 50s elements in that, on that record, as if like, well, we can't relate to each other anymore. I know, let's go back to the 50s, where we're all listening to the same thing, and that will at least make us all sound the same. And I, I always thought that was an underlying thing in that record. But it was one really great song on it, and that was the song that they, was the last one they finished, and it was Bugler. <laughs> Clarence knew it was a great song and he deliberately messed up the vocal so they didn't do it in London they finished it off in America and thank God they did because it, it, the mixing was was great and um, it was the highlight of the album and I think it it ensured that for all its inadequacies that further along was a decent album at the end because it was saved by one master track I think um, other elements in it were pretty good but Bugler was like thank you that's that's what we want this is the kind of quality we want Give us, give us another six songs like that and you know, you'd have a great album. In a lot of ways, the birds at their best were kind of, um, would pick up signals from the times and, and, and kind of communicate them back to an audience in a way that was extremely compelling. You know, by the time of Father and Long, I mean, I think that there was a sense that maybe on everybody's part or maybe on, on McGuinn's part that the band had kind of outlived its time. By the time, of further along, you're, you're hearing a band that is fast losing interest, really. And uh, they're wondering where this leads, where can they go. Um, there's talk of 
a reunion of the original band. So, you know, McGuinn has got uh, David Geffen whispering in his ear, and Geffen could be, uh, you know, a very persuasive man. Um, round about the same time, he also talked Dylan into leaving Columbia and joining him for one studio album and one live album. Um, so it really is all falling apart by now. And uh, when, um, when McGuinn himself says that he probably should have dissolved the band before then, it's hard to disagree with him. The dissolution of the birds finally occurred shortly after the release of Father Along. Though the band had continued to tour and record sporadically, minds were clearly elsewhere, with McGuinn working on the reunion of the original lineup and Parsons and White developing solo projects. Incredibly, the extensive and groundbreaking body of work that the birds had bequeathed to music history was recorded over a period of just eight years, though decades later, its impact continues to resonate. It's an, an indisputable to me, that the birds have a continuing influence on a new generation. I remember uh, before uh, R.E.M. Uh, was signed to Warner's, they, they considered me as a producer. Well, I went over and listened to them. They sounded like the birds on a sound check, but it sounded like a couple of them were missing, uh, maybe missing some strings. I didn't know what the problem was, but I knew that it was a reduction from what I had heard when I heard the birds. So maybe that has to do with talent. I don't know, but I do know this, that the birds are of a, of a type of music that takes a, great de a, a, that takes a great gift. They took a very bold step in uniting two forms of music which were not thought to have any affinity for each other virtually, which was folk music as it stood in 1964 and electric rock music of the Beatles style in 1964. And they did that even though there was no template for them to work with. And they did it brilliantly. And they kept on doing it with other forms of music after that first successful fusion, bringing in jazz and Indian music for psychedelics, electronic music, and then country rock. And that has set, even if it's on somewhat subconscious, a model for other bands to follow in the last 40 years, taking a different path that's not expected combining elements that you don't think would ever work into something new. That's their big legacy. Absolutely groundbreaking records that have, have changed the face of music, really. And as I say, to do that not once, but three times in the course of a short career is, is really quite phenomenal. Um, I mean, you can argue that on one level they didn't do anything truly revolutionary. Uh, all they did was take existing elements and put them together in a way that uh, hadn't been done before. But hey, you know, that's, that's revolutionary enough for me. The bird's gift was the ability to take uh, developments in the culture and communicate them to a mass audience and bring them out onto a big stage. So, sure, Dylan had played with electric instruments on... Um, bringing it all back home and you know people were beginning to explore that connection between folk and rock but Mr. Tambourine Man is the song that clarified that process for millions of people and certainly you know Dylan had recorded in Nashville um, you know the Beatles had done country numbers but the birds were the people that incited the whole discussion about country rock so the birds played uh, an essential role, partly in shaping and partly in communicating, uh, you know, very important musical developments. <laughs>